the year is one. Beneath the ruins. The year is one. Walpurgis Nacht. Walpurgis Nacht. Welcome to Radio On, the historical series, and my guest today is Nicholas Schreck. Nicholas, we've just had our first holiday in Berlin, celebrating Liberation or VE Day on the 8th of May, and here we are. Where are we, Nicholas? We are at Wilhelmstrasse 88, the former and final residence of an obscure Austrian artist named Adolf Hitler who died in the ruins beneath us on April 30th, 1945. We are right over the ruins of the Fuhrer bunker. And the reason I chose this when you asked me uh, what historical place in Berlin we should hold this interview is because Hitler did such an exemplary example of demonstrating quarantining and self-isolation long before the coronavirus. Yes, and for our listeners that uh, are in the future now, and uh, maybe in the very far future, I had no idea about the coronavirus. If there will be a far future. <laughs> a human future. Um, we're immersed in this now in Berlin as well, so not only are we above the Führer bunker, we are surrounded, as you say, yes, by this virus as well. So. Right, and, and another reason citizens of the future who we are addressing if this is left in a time capsule for martians to discover someday indeed when we see how humanity destroyed itself the other reason i chose the fuhrer bunker as a historical place to address the nation from <laughs> is um all of the whining and complaining and misery mongering and panic and fear mongering that all too many people have reacted to this health crisis with, I, Berliners especially should remember, it could be much worse and it has been much worse. And to have some kind of historical perspective, 75 years ago today, in May of 1945, Berlin was a smoking ruin. Hardly any food was available. Most of the male population had been killed the female populace of Berlin were being raped by Soviet soldiers to the point where you could hear their screams every night. Corpses were laying in the street. Uh, traitors were hung on the lampposts. And, you know, we need to develop some sort of historical perspective and distance to see that humanity's self-destructive nature repeats itself again and again. And this current crisis is nothing compared to some of the many other crises that have occurred before. So I, I would recommend that people look at history and, you know, gain some kind of perspective on what, you know, when people compare this to the apocalypse, it is not the apocalypse. It could be much, much worse. Mm. And you've been here before? Yes. To this spot? Yes, in a former life and... Um, <laughs> And in uh, 1983, when I first came to Berlin, I was living in London, and I came to Berlin to research the first book that I was writing at that time, which I never published, and went as an American, went through, at the height of the Cold War, went through Checkpoint Charlie and visited East Germany in the DDR extensively at that time in oh. 1983. So that was at the height of Reagan Soviet red baiting and, and World War III looming, yes. you know, atomic bomb threatening tension between the Soviet Union and the United States. And so the, you know, the, it was very tense and hostile, the mood between America and the Soviet Union. And so I came to the Deutsche Democratic Republic, as it was called, or misnamed. And uh, at this, where we are now, is a peaceful, orderly, fairly well-organized, ordinary city street in Berlin. Yes. In 1983, it was a ruin. The broken and damaged buildings left over from World War II were still right here, and it looked like the combat had ended a few weeks ago, not 
at that time it had been something like less, you know, a little less than 40 years earlier. But it, at that time, East Germany had not repaired this area of Potsdamer Platz, which is basically where the Führer bunker is located, and it, it was like walking into 1947 rather than 1983. Mm -hmm. And I walked down the street, and it was very, I had a map of it. The young people will not understand what a map is, but <laughs> I had a map to find it. And I asked, there, the only people on these streets right around here were Soviet soldiers. Wow. Not German Volkspolizei, but Soviet occupation mm. troops who could see I was a foreigner. Some of them were hostile, some of them were not. And then I asked one, I asked quite a few, so I, in my broken German at the time, Wo ist der Führerbunker, <laughs> showing the map, and some of them, they all spoke German, a little, right. and so some were hostile or unhelpful, but one was extremely friendly, and he, and he said, Amerikanski, <laughs> where are you from, my friend? And, and I said, California, Hollywood! <laughs> and so he, the Soviet soldier, guided me to where we are now, okay. which at that time was unrecognizable compared to what it looks like today. And these buildings around us, which were built by the communist government as luxury apartment um, living were not here and that and and that was in 1986 in 1983 this was just a like a ruin mm -hmm. and um, by some bizarre luck I um, I came to the Führer bunker and there was one other person there and he turned out to be an Irish historian who was an expert he, he was a like a, a professor of history in Ireland oh. and he knew all about the history of it so he gave me the tour oh, of, where, wow. of where everything was, where this was, where that was, where the bodies were burned. And he happened to be there. He happened to the be time. there and nobody else was there. <laughs> Amazing. So that was a stroke of good luck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, and, then, and then I came back several times over the years. And for many years there was nothing to mark where this is and now the city of Berlin has put up a historical marker explaining where we are. And uh, the reason why they haven't done that in the past is because they feared... Well, this is what the mass media says. They feared that there would be, uh, you know, that it would be a neo-Nazi pilgrimage place or shrine. But as I look around this empty street, I do not see hordes of brown shirts no. gathered or torches. There's so a dog. There's a few there's children. A, there is a dog. It is a suspicious looking dog. <laughs> but. It doesn't have a little mustache, so I think no. we're okay. There's some build, but, building going but on. But anyway, wha yeah. wha it, mostly the DDR, of course, had no nothing to mark that Hitler mm. and Eva Brown and Goebbels, etc., all died here mm. or, or where it was. In fact, you weren't even allowed to talk about it much. Mm. And now there are historical tours that come here, tourists are brought here, it's slowly becoming normalized 75 years after the death of Hitler. I mean, the, the area itself is just housing blocks, uh, right? isn't it? There's nothing uh, unusual or anything about no, it. No, it could be anywhere in the world. There's yeah. nothing even vaguely interesting about the street that we're on. But of course, not only was the bunker here, but the Reich's Chancellery, which Albert Speer built for Hitler in a record-breaking one year, mm. this titanic building that represented the coming to power of the Third Reich. So that was all here too, and that was that was blown up by the Soviets a few years afterwards, but... But they didn't try to blow up the uh, bunker then, or...? Not, not in 1945. It actually wasn't blown up completely until 1986, mm. when these buildings that are around us were constructed. There are still some areas which you could theoretically get into. Ah, but it's not possible now, then? No, no. It would be, it would be extremely dangerous. It's falling apart. It has been blown up. There's some area, there's like a corridor apparently that you can enter, but it's still filled with water okay. and, and not easy to gain access. And what would the, um, the bunker have consisted of then? Part of it had built in 1936 because they were already assuming there could be bombing um, because of the, they were already preparing for war. And then a lot of it was completed in 1943. So it was, it was basically, it became the command center for Hitler had these various um, 
field command centers, all of them named after his nickname, Wolf. So the Wolf Schanze, etc. Various mm. places in Poland and Germany that were um, command centers. He was very rarely in Berlin during the war. That's what I've read as well. Yeah, he so he didn't really like Berlin, and he didn't he <laughs> didn't live in the Reichschancellery very often. He was in his apartment in Munich often. Okay. And after 1939, he was most often at these command centrals. Obviously, as the Soviets. Uh, rapidly took over Eastern Europe on their way to Berlin. He, in January of 1945, with his generals and staff, went underground in this air protection bunker under the Reichschancellery. And he stayed there from January 1945 till April 30th, when he killed himself with Eva Braun. And the only time he went up in that entire time from the bunker was on April 20th, which was his birthday, uh-huh. to award the last pathetic group of Hitler youth who okay. were defending Berlin and to get up and to pat them on the cheek and give them an iron cross for their defense. And, and something a lot of people don't know, the last soldiers defending the Reichschancellery and the bunker were French volunteers from a oh. unit called the Legion Charlemagne. Ah. Charlemagne. Yes. And um, so the last people who were killed here, where we are now, were French volunteers defending the last stand of the Third Reich. How ironic is yeah. that? Yeah. Um, there is a film, uh, the Der Untergang, which I've seen. Uh, yeah. I guess you've seen it as well. Sure. From what you've said, it does seem to be based on some kind of truth. Yeah, the film is basically historically accurate but of course you know Bruno Gantz's performance in my opinion is very exaggerated and over the top and reminiscent of I mean it's a little more nuanced and subtle than the portrayals of Hitler in American propaganda films of the 40s as the you know chewing carpets and screaming and yelling <laughs> but you know he, he definitely was in a very bad physical state. He had Parkinson's disease yeah. in 1945. He was being treated by a quack doctor named Dr. Morell with amphetamine and all kinds of quack cures, bull testicle fluid. And right. so he was in a very bad state. His hands were shaking. He was, you know, he probably would not have lived much longer in the, in the physical state he had been mm. since the bombing um, attempt on his life by Graf von Stauffenberg in 1944. He was not in good condition by then. Mm. So he wasn't going around jogging? Not a lot of jogging going on in the bunker. No. no. Nor was Gehring. <laughs> uh, another thing that I'm interested in is, we, I mean, we have the address here, number 88, Achtenachsisch Wilhelmstrasse. Yeah. And eight, the number eight seems to be significant. From yeah, well, the odd thing is that after the war, 88 was used as a code among old Nazis to say Heil Hitler, because eight is eight is the, in the alphabet, H is eight. <laughs> so HH is eight, eight. Uh, so it uh, was a code word if you said in, uh, in, in 1945, where it was then illegal to use the words or to give the so-called Hitler Gruss, they would say that as like a code word between people and that has continued to be a tradition. So is it purely coincidental? It's purely coincidental. uh, That the uh, Hitler bunker is under number 88, Wilhelmstrasse. Why do you think they put it here in the first place? This is just literally, this was underneath the Reichschancellery, which was the center of the German government. Mm. This whole area, was where the German government had been since, mm. you know, since the Kaiser time, so. Mm. I tried finding this in the past, many years ago, and I thought it was under a children's playground. Well, the children's playground is right over there. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah, I see. That, w- that used to be the only part of it you could see because this was all covered with rubble and, you know, broken pieces of buildings that had been overgrown by grass. Mm. But now that that's all been cleared away, we're a little closer to it. So that's the past, but should we discuss the catastrophe of the well, present? Well, let's, let's try and connect it somehow. Yeah. Because well, as I, 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 guess as I said, is... people who are complaining about staying in their apartment for, except to go to the supermarket, should think 
that not only was Hitler and the general staff and all these other people, you know, under the earth for three months, but most Germans were living in basements, yes. starving, no, no heating, no coal, mm. you know, hardly any wood to burn to make a fire, mm. and under constant threat, you know, if you went out in the street, there was, Berlin was constantly being bombed. So people were living like that 75 years ago. So I think it's, it's not asking much to stay indoors and watch YouTube. <laughs> we are lucky here in Berlin, actually, isn't it? Because it, it has a very low rate of uh, the coronavirus, it seems. Yeah, well, I think... In Germany, in fact. Yeah, compared to I, well, I think the reason for that compared to other countries I won't name is that we are currently governed by a former quantum research scientist and countries that are run by a former reality TV host <laughs> are not faring as well with quite as many um, indeed there must be a fan <laughs> <laughs> today in fact I heard uh, an article uh, talking about uh, Germany as well they were interviewing on BBC they were interviewing a guy and he said yes the country is being run by grown-ups uh, yes. compared to other countries. Yeah, well, I think, yeah. I think that speaks to a problem that is going to face humanity increasingly and has been for the past few years, is that the go most of the governments of the world are, are now run by uneducated thugs, basically. And what we're seeing right now, an infection worse than the coronavirus, which will pass, is the idiotic and credulous belief in, I would not even deign to respect to call them conspiracy theories. Mm. They are childish conspiracy fantasies that have absolute, are totally groundless. And I see the massive problem that we're going to face when this is over. And, and what this crisis has revealed is the lack of education, for decades, how poorly educated people are, how little logical reasoning they have, how little ability to determine what is true and not true, how to know what is a reliable source. So I think far more ominous for the future than the virus, which is just another of several pandemics that have literally plagued humanity since the beginning of time. If you look at history, this is not even the worst one. Mm. Uh, the main problem is this increasing mainstreaming, and again, I can't, to, to call them a theory is to deign to give them even the slightest respect that they don't deserve. So I, I think that is, is the most disturbing thing that we've seen here, and there is no cure for stupidity. That's the problem. As far as uh, conspiracy theories are concerned, which particular well, there are so there are so many. Even even to name them is to dignify them in some <laughs> ways. They have absolutely no basis in fact whatsoever. So I mean, the basics are that this is a man-made disease. That it is, in the words of a recent moronic documentary, a pandemic. Mm -hmm. That this was planned uh. by by dark, sinister forces. Basic, you know, even to name these conspiracies is really. It's like talking to a lunatic and saying, you know, and giving credence to what a lunatic is saying. I don't think, I have no compassion for the people that spread these ideas. I understand they're frightened and panicked, but we have gotten to the point where because of the internet in the past 20 something years, allowing every uneducated imbecile who has no expertise in any subject whatsoever to rail off at the mouth about whatever opinion they want and their opinion seems as valid as the opinion of, of actual experts who know what they're talking about. This has eroded human knowledge and human understanding of science and reason to the point where we have entered what I predicted decades ago with Radio Werewolf in the 80s, a new dark age. And we are, we are in a dark age right now where science, education, expertise, knowledge is really like falling apart. It's ignored and neglected mm -hmm. and emotion, feeling, mm -hmm. I feel this way is more important than these are the facts. Mm -hmm. 
And this is the underlying catastrophe humanity is facing, much worse than this temporary plague. Mm. And on a positive level, can you see anything yes, positive yes, yes, coming absolutely. out of this? Well, on a positive level, personally, I, again, I'll, I can't be completely positive about it, but for artists, for musicians, for writers, speaking personally, I cannot understand why any of them are complaining about this at all, because other than, of course, that we can't perform or, or connect to an audience, you have time now to write 15 symphonies, 18 novels, 3,000 paintings, Anyone who is truly an inspired artist should be very happy to use this opportunity to create undisturbed by the machinery of capitalism. You should be able to sit there and create. So it makes me wonder about the artists who are whining and complaining about this. Why are they really doing it? Is that they are only doing it for ego approval or to be applauded or do they actually want to create art? So that is to, speaking personally, as someone whose main concern is my artistic endeavors, I don't understand why this, I would say that's a great opportunity and hopefully a lot of music, novels, art, etc. should come out of this endeavor. Secondly, on a spiritual level, which I understand and which has been made very evident by this, is it's obvious very few people have even the thinnest inner resources whatsoever, to a degree I would not even imagine. And as a spiritual teacher, I encounter people who mostly who are at least interested in their inner life or the spiritual world or the life of the mind or of consciousness. And for spiritually minded people, this is also a golden opportunity to use this as a retreat to explore their inner world, to understand the spiritual life, to meditate, whatever religious practice you may have, this is a perfect opportunity. This is a particular moment in the interview and then it's kind of connected really uh, in a sense because there's a cleaning vehicle here, cleaning the pavement. You know, right. Below so us. So we'll use it symbolically to, <laughs> yes. to, to cleanse and purify. Perhaps. It seems like a physical manifestation right. of our conversation. So, <laughs> yeah, so on a positive level for artists, musicians, writers, or any kind of creative people, it is an opportunity that should be seized, and I really can't comprehend why that, that should be what people who are creative people should be doing with this time. For spiritual people, mm. they should be using it as a retreat and an opportunity to go much deeper into their spiritual practice and to understand and to see very clearly that the basic lesson of every school of mysticism, whatever religious background it may be, that the material world is impermanent, insubstantial. You can't rely on governments, stock markets, or even the physical body. Mm. Uh, as the Buddha taught, old age, sickness, and death are what occur in this samsaric realm, and now you are faced with mortality, with the possibility of illness. And thinking about mortality should be a positive thing for people who are seeking enlightenment and liberation from the material world. You can see the material world cannot be relied on, and that instead you must develop your spiritual life and train your mind and consciousness. So that's an opportunity. The third positive thing, which is a cliche many people have noticed, is that when the human species and its destructive habits are removed from the earth for a while, the air becomes purer, the water becomes purer, animals return to their natural habitat. Mm. So for animals, other than humans, for nature, this is a great benefit. And if you have an anthropocentric view of the world where humanity is the most important thing, then this is a disaster. Mm. For nature, that humanity has been destroying since the Industrial Revolution, then it's a great benefit. So that's a very positive thing that the environment has a slight chance to recover from the damage that humanity has done. I'm not very optimistic, as some people are, that when this is over, that govern not our current idiotic 
idiocracy governments will take seriously the ecological. It's very clear that if you remove the human factor mm. from the earth, the air becomes purer, nature returns very quickly. But I don't, I don't really think that's going to happen. But mm. at least for anyone that has a brain, they should be able to see with their own eyes mm. that nature is healing from the human disease, which is one of the worst pandemics inflicting the earth. Feels like a very um, a healing time, uh, even just being here with you above this place. And uh... Well, it can be a time to heal, and it can be a time for all of humanity to reflect on their inner life. That, that is obviously the most important gift we've been given and every catastrophe can be brought onto the spiritual path as an inspiration. Nicholas, uh, thank you for joining us yes. here today yes. for this uh, historical series and uh, talking from above the uh, Führer bunker. Okay, thank you. Farewell.